or a sedan chair. <laughs> well, we have a very interesting subject this morning, which uh, gives considerable insight into the systems of philosophy that have developed over the last two or three thousand years. In the, in the olden times, uh, there was a, a poet who said that there is a flower in the field for every star in the sky. And there is also a star in the sky for every flower in the field. <clears throat> this is a kind of an interesting statement because it helps us to see, I think, one of the most important of our religious convictions. The proof before our own eyes of the universality of the principles we believe. We do not have to depend upon books. We do not have to depend upon too many contacts with other people. Merely to look out upon the world as it is, is to behold the perfect workings of the law, regardless of how we may view it. Nature is the great mandala. Nature reveals to us the entire workings of the invisible principles of life. It does not explain them. It does not prove them. It does nothing but express them. It tells us that no matter where, when, or why these laws continue to operate, that they represent a tremendous expression of beauty. They are a tremendous expression of the divine plan. And in the nature around us, God becomes flesh. <clears throat> God becomes a material substance to be seen, to be heard, to be known. There are many abstractions that we have to accept in life, but the most tremendous realization that we have is that looking out upon the vast expanse of nature, we behold the perfect workings of the law. In the Orient, the mandala is a meditation symbol. It is merely a picture of the realities. In the West, nature is a great mandala symptom and symbol. And it also has the manifestation of the beauties and wonders of existence. In the ancient mystical philosophies of the East, we have the earth, the earth itself spread out as a wonderful diagram, a diagram with thousands of figures wonderful formulas and immense expanses of visual extension. All these things surround the foot of the great mountain, Sumuru, or Mount Miru, the abode of the gods. In the midst of the mandala rises the mountain of the divine. Over here we have all of the hierarchies, the orders of life, that are found in the Kabbalah and the Gnosis, in Zen and Hinduism. We see the universe spread out as a great garden in the midst of which rises the buildings and temples of the divine principle. Now, we were told some time ago, and I think Lamarian supported the statement, that the earth has many more than two motions. We have thought mostly of these revolution and rotation, but there is also a motion called the uh, oscillation of the pole. This particular motion carries with it a certain change in the north polar axis. And so that the north pole does not continuously point to the north star. This shifting of the poles results in there being two north poles. A physical north pole and a magnetic north pole. And these two are not the same. The physical pole we count as we always have. The magnetic pole we count as it is counted in the esoteric systems, namely that it is a great center of magnetism. It is a great center of power coming to the earth from the sun and from even distant stars. We have to realize, as I've mentioned before, that the earth is an embryo. The earth is not born. The earth is in a condition of preparation for birth. It exists within the great body of the sun, only the sons are alive and born. The rest are embryos. So the embryo of the earth 
is connected to the sun by a great magnetic umbilical cord. And the ancient peoples have very carefully studied all these relationships and powers and conditions. Some years ago, Roy Chapman Andrews, exploring the Gobi Desert, came upon a, ma a place which was completely surrounded by snakes. He was unable to get his way through it and discarded the idea and gave up the effort. Probably he was near the Gobina, the sacred center of the magnetic pole. We also know that the Hindus had their hierarchies of deities placed in a certain relationship with the magnetic and physical poles of the earth. The whole situation, therefore, is to emphasize a single point, namely that the earth as we see it is an unfolding panorama of a divine plan forever working. Now we notice in the uh, earth particularly the tremendous variation of life forms. The life forms divide into generally four classes, mineral, plant, animal, and human. These are dwelling together in a similar and I mean, practically identical atmosphere except for certain modifications that man himself causes. We realize also that these conditions or these life waves are here to grow and unfold their natural potential. Each of these kingdoms, therefore, is growing in the same atmosphere, part of the same picture. And each of the kingdoms has a smaller mandala that fits into the larger one. And each of the kingdoms has its subdivisions and so on and so on. But as the earth, earth itself is an unborn embryo, so these other kingdoms are also unborn embryos of their own orders of life. There is a continuous unfolding of life wherever we turn and wherever we seek to understand. Now we come to the mineral kingdom, which is the beginning of our environment. We notice there is tremendous emphasis upon color. There is also a transformation, an evolution, from a very coarse, rough type of mineral to the finest gems and the most subtle, almost etheric types of mineral forms. Some minerals are so subtle that they are invisible. These, therefore, are the unfoldings of the mineral kingdom with their own mandala, with their own part in the larger one, and their own place in man himself, who is a composite picture of these mandalas in the realms where he functions. After that comes the uh, vegetable kingdom. And this is connected to the mineral by a bridge because all these evolutionary processes take place in a harmonious sequence. Uh, the bridge in this case is mosses and lichens, half vegetable, half mineral, clinging still partly to the vegetable form but growing out to become plants. And in the plant kingdom we have uh, probably one of the most beautiful diffusions that is possible for us to examine. We think of mandalas usually as pictures that are stable, that do not change quickly. And in this we have come perfectly in harmony with the vegetable kingdom. Because this kingdom has all the variations of growth with that very little variation of motion. The uh, patterns last, continue and repeat themselves for thousands of years. But each of the patterns is itself beautiful. If we go out and look at a field in the late afternoon, we see many different colors, shadows, lines, and we wonder at the symmetries and the harmonies of it all. The same is true if we go in the early morning. Wherever we look at this grand mandala of nature, we see something of importance. So we begin to wonder how, why people haven't noticed this more. We are forever looking for answers to things, but in these other kingdoms many of these things are answered, but we haven't understood enough to look to see what was happening. And in the plant kingdom we have the most perfect opportunity to study because this kingdom is a kind of fixed thing. It will remain as long as we protect it. And the merry and various misfortunes of the plant kingdom we are tracing directly to our own interferences. In all of the mandalas of the four worlds that we hear of in the Hindu. There is not one in which there is any natural or inevitable inconsistency. Everything is harmonious. Everything works with everything else. 
but there are various interchanges and some minor variations and, and various periods of time which cause variations to the grand patterns but all the variations are equally as beautiful look out into a beautiful meadow of flowers and you see truly a, a work of transcendent spiritual integrity we find that no two plants will in any way uh, disagree with each other in color or in their forms or places each thing is harmonious in itself and the vast orchestra of color of the plant kingdom is utterly harmonic we therefore look out upon a picture that knows no war what we say these plants do attack each other they do afflict each other well is that really true or is it mostly the fact that we have disturbed this balance and by various uh, misuses of nature have thrown these harmonies out of pattern so that there no longer is a proper harmony man because of an individuality which he possesses is able to uh, variously modify practically all of the patterns of natural law in the physical world but wherever he not modifies them unreasonably or destructively he merely injures himself there is no inharmony in the actual patterns of life but these patterns if misused if arranged in false patterns if variously disobeyed can bring down tremendous catastrophes and bring great tragedy and terror to the natural uh, vegetation and life it's possibly perfectly possible for the vegetable kingdom to have a flood like that of Noah's in which a great part of it may be wiped out but that flood is not due definitely to the plant kingdom itself but, but to the imposition of other forces from the outside and that is why even human beings observing mutations of their relationships wonder whether it is the work of God or demon or accident this is the way the patterns work out now there is a link between uh, the plant kingdom and the animal and this plant is uh, this link is plants that move the plants that like the pitcher plants or the mouse trap or the uh, fly trap plants all these have motion also they are beginning to develop a digestive system so the mutation of the plant goes across gradually to the animal kingdom the animal mandala is a very complicated one and has an another vast pattern of secondary consequences there are naturally seven major branches of animals each of these is an evolutionary stage each one of them is growing according to its own laws and proprieties each one is releasing another phase of itself it's a, it, the uh, animal releases motion whereas uh, the plant has released uh, color or other properties the uh, plant motions are also of a great interest now if the plant it's, uh, and the uh, animal motions nearly fascinate us we find for example now the appearance of group entities we find the appearance of uh, guiding powers uh, in Buddhism we learn that the bodhisattvas or great enlightened ones may take upon themselves the bodies of animals for a time in order to preach to them the blessed doctrine this is supposed to have happened in an early incarnation of Gautama, Gautama Buddha that he, he became uh, embodied in an animal and then sacrificed his life for another animal so that it could live these things are part of a moral instruction which the West has very little time for but in Eastern philosophy even the great saint must celebrate his own saint sanctity by sacrificing his life and all that he is to the salvation of a part of a lesser kingdom so this is what happened again in the Christian mystery that the enlightened one sacrificed his life for the unenlightened now in the Buddhist system the animals are not evil they are, un they are limited in their propensities but they have wonderful qualities and characteristics and of the animal kingdoms there are many that are extremely intelligent 
What the animal has is motion, which the plant doesn't have. We do not know how much of the mental factor is beginning to develop within the animal kingdom. But there is indication that there is such a development. I think I told you before the story of the uh, German shepherd dogs in Europe who became famous because they could talk. They talked to their paw on a board with the letters of the alphabet. And they uh, were tra trained to transform <laughs> words into these board letters or vice versa or to express themselves by using these letters. And of course they were with human beings a great deal who tutored them as much as they could to, to use these boards and these alphabets. A number of tests were made of these dogs and the tests were usually made behind locked doors in which no person relating to the dog was present. Usually they were professors or doctors or stu students of anthropology. On one occasion one of the dogs was asked uh, what do, you, are you, do you believe in death? And the dog patted out on the board. There is no death. Therefore, we cannot say for sure just how much consciousness these animals have. But we do know that their loyalty is wonderful. We know that their companionship to the disabled is extraordinary. And we also know that constant contact with human beings is a way in which the uh, animals are able to gain a new dimension which they will use later. Uh, probably the most highly evolved, at least one most of the most highly evolved, is the elephant. The elephant has a memory. The elephant has a tremendous uh, ability to accomplish particular tax tasks. And perhaps most of all, an elephant is the only animal we are certain has a sense of humor. <laughs> And of course, probably that comes from association with human beings to whom the uh, elephant must turn for recreation. Uh, I remember the story probably I've told you, but it may be worth repeating, of uh, this trip up to Amba outside of Baroda. And, uh, uh, pardon me, outside of Jaipur. And uh, on the elephant, we, we were being taken up to the mountain. And among those that was there was an English lady with a flowered hat. She had a white hat with a flowered uh, bouquet on the top and a veil that tied under her chin. The elephant got a look at this and it possibly fascinated the animal. Uh, it, it became so uh, important that the animal just sort of stood and shivered. And uh, uh, finally, when the parade started, the lady was on the back of the elephant with the others and it started up this long hill that led to Amba. And slowly, quietly, the trunk of the elephant twisted around under the back of its neck and came up and by behind and managed to get to the point where it could reach that hat. <laughs> it made one dive for the hat. The hat went off the lady's head and hung in the air about ten feet above ground while the, uh, while the elephant chortled with glee and then went up the hill, leading the hat all the way to the city of Ambal. <laughs> now, you can't say a thing like that doesn't prove something. <laughs> it also proves other types of things. There is a more dramatic, possibly unhappy account of a, a boy who put a, a needle in a peanut and fed it to an elephant. The elephant was very badly sickened by it. We recovered, but it was very bad. And uh, apparently... It would never forget. Several years later, that same boy went to the circus again. The elephant saw him and nearly killed him. The elephant had a memory. He was not, he was not badly damaged, but he was badly frightened. The elephant did not forget. And also, the elephant has certain moral qualities which the Hindus have made much of. One of these is frugality and the, the, the practical side of life. An elephant will seldom be out of food or a bare place where he can't get it. He will be seldom in trouble with anything because he is able to adjust to almost any possible circumstance. And as a result of that, Ganesha becomes the god of prosperity in India. He is uh, looked upon with great uh, hope and is in the windows of nearly all important shops in India. So it will be a figure, a picture or something of Ganesha. An elephant red with a fat little human body. 
uh, if your fa- fountain, if your business goes bad, if you come close to bankruptcy or have to give the store away, the picture of statue in the window is turned upside down. This indicates that Ganesha is no longer protecting you. So all these fables of animals and so forth tie into the human way of life. Everywhere that uh, there has been contact, long contact between human beings and animals, there is a strong fraternity established among them. And uh, we, there is a continual recognition that animals can become a great joy and a great security to people who are otherwise lonely or unable to share in the no- normal activities of life. So the animal kingdom is very, very much in form. The uh, missing link between the, uh, hu- the animal and the human is no longer apparently in existence. The ape is not a, a, a side branch or a partial human being. It is a different type of evolution entirely. But anyway, the animal kingdom is thus represented. And then we come finally to that remarkable, extraordinary kingdom, the fourth element, namely humanity. In this we camp again the four elements, the mineral element, the vegetable element, the animal element, and the human. And these are equivalent to earth, water, fire, and air. The four elements. Then the fifth element is the quintessence of these. It is the the alchemical uh, mystery of the adept. The fifth element, or akasha, is the symbol of the development of the inner resources by which uh, the human being attains to a condition superior to humanity. Uh, he is called a hero by the Greeks. He is all, there's very names given to him. But he is a step above humanity when he attains to this. And when he attains to this, it means that he has made a very important step forward in the de- dedication of his life to the search for truth. He is the hero, the saint, the sage. A saint is really, therefore, a p- member of this fifth element, the, which is the quintessence and is that represented in literature by a superhuman human being. This superhuman being being one who has no longer the capacity to break the laws of life, but will obey all things. Now in these balances also we have other things. We cannot believe that any of these kingdoms uh, under the divine plan can escape from the diligence of the divine power. Actually, Every living thing, from the most humble stone to to the most sacred star, is part of a great order of life, a great galaxy of powers, a great pattern of realities with which we should all be more or less concerned. For our purpose today, however, we want to deal with the psychology and mysticism of nature. Nature now we are using to symbolize the natural world with its kingdoms and its various processes. We notice that all of the relationships of life are somewhere to be found here. All of the relationships of human beings are to be found here also. Everything that relates to the evolution of our type of creation will be found in various degrees of development here in this marvelous system of natural law. We are particularly, uh, I think, uh, impressed by the fact that natural law is nearly always beautiful. It is supremely orderly. There is no flow, no break, no distortions in it. It flows forever in its own nature. Now, this is the kind of world that man inherited. He inherited a garden. We are told definitely that in this garden there were trees. Well, trees are now part of the uh, plant kingdom. But these trees are also symbols of growth and indicate a process of evolution in which all things are growing up towards the fulfillment of themselves. We also realize that this Garden of Eden, so-called, was simply a balanced or equilibrium in nature. It is that which exists before the fall, that is, before the descent into composite existence. It is that which must come again when we rise from the misfortunes and passions and troubles of our present state. 
so that we are suspended in the, mid in the middle distance between two forms of superior existence, that from which we came and that to which we go. We are part of an evolving and growing problem. And the purpose of the entire growth is to achieve the realization that all things arise from ourselves when we are in problems. That we are actually here to learn. And that everything that we learn is part of the process of growing. And also we are here to accept personal responsibility for the mistakes that we make. We are here to recognize that the reason we suffer is ourselves. We are not suffering because of a jealous God. We are not suffering because of an outrageous law in nature. We are suffering because we are, broke, are break, breaking the harmony between ourselves and nature. We are going contrary to the patterns for which we were intended. Now in nature, as the thought of God as being exemplified in nature, we therefore come to the realization that nature in its natural state is a perfect working of the law. In it the divine is achieving its perfect ends. It is bringing things from a lesser state to a greater one. It is perfecting all things towards an infinite good toward which all life is moving. Therefore, the various kingdoms of nature that have their different rules and laws are entitled to the proper recognition and respect. The weak is not weak in order that the strong may exploit it. The weak is weak because it has not yet gained strength and therefore that the stronger can give it a hand. Everywhere we can help growth and we can also hinder it. And wherever we hinder nature, we bring certain inevitable consequences down upon ourselves. Now we are perverting and misusing the four elements which constitute the physical structure of nature. We are destroying, disrupting, damaging the four elements, the mineral, the plant, the vegetable, and the animal. We have a sort of fifth position in this because we do represent uh, the quintessence of these evolutionary steps, that is humanity. But we are very definitely injuring our environment. We are injuring it by neglecting to understand it. And in trying to understand it, we write books, and we send expeditions, we create laboratories, and we do all kinds of abstract things trying to find out about something. This is not necessary and certainly isn't advisable. Today we are probably trying to prepare to put a man on Mars. Uh, maybe that's important because maybe there won't be much Earth left. We may have to migrate some way. Well, maybe not so well. But anyway, this is not the prime purpose. We are not here to do this type of thing. We are not here to defeat each other in military excellence. We are not here to create great wealth or leave great poverty. We are here to grow. And the great text of growth is here in our very midst. All we have to do is look out of a window into a natural scene and we see growth. We see the laws are working together. We see how each thing is necessary to the ultimate good. And little by little we gain that all things are necessary to the proper good of man. The human being must redeem what he has destroyed. It is not that some evil power created war. Nature did not. And if nature at some time appears to have a militant tendency, it is usually to break up a crystallization of some kind and then goes on in its own placid way. Nature destroys nothing. Nature will not accept neg ne negativity. Uh, nature insists on bringing things to grow. Sometimes, however, things don't want to grow. And as a result of that, we have a series of conflicts. But man is the only one of these creations that can stand against the laws of nature for a time. But ultimately, the laws are stronger than he is. Now, way back in the dawn of things also, we, in studying nature, we come upon another type of problem, a very interesting one, probably best uh, represented perhaps in the writings of Theophrastus of Hohenheim, Paracelsus. 
if we find that the ancients all believed that these various elements had governments of their own. There was not only the government of humanity by human beings, but there was a government of animals by animals, a government of vegetation by vegetation, and even a government of minerals by minerals. They were, they were all under leadership, and each element was evolving. Each element was reaching out towards the next higher level, or within itself, or above itself. And out of this came what the old people used to refer to as the nature spirits. These nature spirits were the guardians of elements, guardians of types of life. They were ma major uh, manifestations of the powers that guide uh, various creatures to the fulfillment of themselves. Therefore, these were the nymphs, the salamanders, the undines, and the gnomes. The gnomes were the custodians of the earth element. Now the uh, element is a world of itself. And there may be more earth than a great many other places besides here. But earth is not only a part of us, but it is an empire of itself, with its own rulers, with its own way of life. And in its invisible nature, hierarchies of beings. In the visible nature, the earth seems to be merely something we want to use. But the more we explore earth, the more we study it, the more we find that it is intelligent. In everything, if we dig finely, deep enough, we will find wisdom. The wisdom of things of their, for their own need. The wisdom of what is necessary to fulfill the purposes of their own existence. So we have the uh, legends that come out. The legends of the gnomes, the little people, the elves, the Nibelungen people. We have the mysterious people like Alberic who hoard the treasures of the earth. And we find, as in Albertus Magnus, that these spirits can be induced to reveal their treasures to human beings under certain conditions. When resulting of anything else, there is always this, in nature, there is always the invisible power that protects these little creatures from, from evils that we would not even notice. We, uh, everything is guarded it has to uh, disobey in order to lose guardianship it must voluntarily break faith in order to lose the strength which has been given to it by the creator so we have the uh, gnomes who are guarding the treasures of the earth and who do all kinds of nice things and one uh, a great authority on the gnomes of course is the Irish people and they have known the little people for ages and uh, believe firmly in them. Uh, the, uh, all, not, all the church and the com uh, comments on the subject has not destroyed the belief that there are little people who can come and help. And when the old man in the house is sick, these little people will milk his cow for him. And they will also be very happy to help him if he will put out a saucer with a few drops of hard liquor for them to enjoy. <laughs> That's very important. Everywhere in Europe you have the little people. And in Asia you have the sprites and spirits. Everywhere on earth there is a population that is invisible to us. But that is not simply a population that exists to cause us wonder. It is a population busy, hard at work, taking care of its own responsibilities. Occasionally these responsibilities come very close to human interests. Then we find stories and accounts and uh, even some other <coughs> uh, serious proofs that these uh, intersection, intersection actually take place. The Greeks said they're daemons. The church took the word daemon and made demon out of it. But it wasn't that way in the Greeks at all. It was not an evil spirit. It was a guardian. It was a helper. Probably the most famous of all the daemons was the daemon of Socrates. This was a spirit that came to take to protect him. It felt that he was going to have a rough time anyway, so the gods in their wisdom appointed this spirit to take care of him. And this demon accompanied him everywhere he went. And one day when he was going down the road, this demon came up to him and pushed him violently off the path. And then with a chuckle, sat down beside him and watched a great herd of animals go by at top speed. If he hadn't been warned, he would have been trampled to death. Also, he, Socrates always liked to have a little communion with his daemon. 
he would sit quietly under a tree somewhere and the spirits would talk to him. They would tell him things he wants to know. He would tell him about himself, things he should do. He would give him an understanding and greater patience and the willingness to accept the negative fate that came to him in the end. And it is said in the last dialogues of Socrates that shortly before he took the hemlock as rather die than disprove what he or discourage what he attempted to do this daemon said goodbye I'll see you later so these daemon people and all that type of thing are part of a mythology but they all go back to nature they are all part of a great realization that nature is all alive that nature is not only alive but it is all intelligent in one way or another it has its own skills its own ways of doing things but they are all wise and they are all good if we want to understand them now many people especially mystically inclined I'd like to sit down quietly under a tree somewhere and just feel the beauty of nature this was the secret of Lao Tzu the great Chinese philosopher he was a very humble origin his father was merely a gardener on the estates of a mandarin but as a child Lao Tzu sat quietly up under a tree <coughs> and meditated he learned from the inside of things and not from the outsides he learned from the silence that voices spoke to him out of the earth and out of the air and he became the mysterious man who wrote only one short poem and then disappeared forever and where did he go? that is a question some say of course that he met the honorable death of his time but actually according to the esoteric tradition he regarded himself a great big water ox a bison type of creature sat on its back and this animal carried him out beyond the walls of China beyond the Great Wall and into the Gobi where he joined the immortals who had been sitting there <coughs> since the dawn of time so we have all these interesting comments and thoughts about the subjects now on nature also we have the mandala factor which I think is the thing we should all give most attention to we learn from this picture which we look out to the window to see a, a, a magnificent scenic view of eternity captured in time out there for a moment the world stands still and we see it in its own clear light we see the old mountains where the sages go we see the deep valleys where the saints sit in quiet meditation we see the great art that was going to be captured on silk and also the great philosophy which was to be found in Mencius and Lao Tzu and Confucius all of these things were the result of the contemplation of nature instead of going to books where conflict is inevitable and two authors contradict each other you go out to the vast infinity of nature where nothing contradicts anything else everything if it appears to contradict is because of our own human ignorance the ignorance the contradiction is in ourselves not in the nature around us so we have these worlds of interlocking meditations where we can gather or by ourselves contemplate the beauties of life here we see the symmetry of color we see the tremendous power of all the different shades and subshades that mark individual degrees of growth we also as we Paracels has pointed out become face to face with another fact that everything that exists in nature is good for something for man we think of man as sort of provide of you know, standing in your of everything or presiding over everything but every one of the things we see in the earth everything in in plants even in minerals all these things have meaning for the human being and probably the greatest of all of these processes was developed and brought into focus by Hi Hi Hippocrates of course the father of medicine 
they were also very clearly set forth in the labors of Dr. Nicholas Culpepper, the first great herbalist to be recorded. This uh, herbalist was the one who realized that every plant in the earth was created to be of use to something. That it was necessary to recognize that wisdom came from nature, health came from nature, love came from nature, religion came from nature, science came from nature. From the contemplation of the inevitable harmonic patterns of the infinite, all truths are revealed. But the average person cannot reveal or understand or accept this naked truth. He cannot accept truth without all kinds of embellishments. He cannot watch the weed and grow. He cannot richen his soul with a dandelion, but he could, should be able to. Science has already proved to us through the microscope and the telescope the infinite variety of life. Also that the smallest and most minute things have just as much right to exist as the most noble things. We become gradually aware of a universe in which there is nothing but life and death is nothing but the ashes of outgrown life. There is no way in which we can avoid the realization that these mandalas of nature are the secret of health. We find everywhere the contemplation of things as they really are is becoming difficult. We now see so little of nature and by degrees we are killing what there is of it. We are destroying the greatest source of instruction that can ever come to the human being. We are destroying the proof of peace. We are destroying the reality of fraternity. And we are gradually causing the brotherhood of man to come into a fatal antagonism. We are not permitting the very great message of nature to come through. That nature left to its own devices will go on forever. Nature with a little help from man will be exterminated. The, the everywhere, the disobeying of natural law is the beginning of the end of, of security and peace. We now see around us a great deal of trouble, more of it than we like to face. We see the five, six, or seven great problems or issues that we must all face in order to survive. And we go to the school book to try and find an answer, and it isn't there. We go to the laboratory, but they are too busy working on nuclear weaponry. We look around among the clergy, and it's strange to see how little we find the essential solution. We go into these new groups of people that are coming along, and they're doing some fine work, but, for some, but somehow they don't touch the fact that it's not necessary or to simply say that we want to grow. We have to grow by proving it through action. We cannot have peace of soul by meditation unless we overcome the inharmonies in ourselves by spiritual growth and maturity. All these things have that meaning. We can outgrow our troubles, but we can never walk out on them. But they will dog us as uh, the hounds of hell. So we find everywhere the great text of what we need. Not always something great and tremendous, but some little things that help. And we learn from nature that we must try to discover in everything we do what the law wants, what is proper to the development and providing of progress for all creatures. What the law doesn't want, it destroys. We don't say it doesn't really destroy it by an act of destruction. A flash of lightning doesn't come down and destroy something. But nature allows to perish that which does not serve its purposes. When we disobey, we cut off the basic energy of things so that they, we no longer have a vitalization. These things become passive and negligible and slide, gradually fade out. So looking out upon the great mandala, we realize that the easiest thing in the world is for nations and peoples to dwell together in peace. Out in the field we have all kinds of... 
We have forest life, we have animal life, we have everything. And for thousands, perhaps millions of years, these things have existed in balanced ratio to each other. They've survived side by side, limited by certain laws to prevent unbalance, of, uh, developing certain traits to grow. There has been no bitter war of elements except by man. All the rest has been a growth. There has been struggle. Things haven't always been right. Animals and birds and species have made mistakes. But all in all, all of these imbalances are solved by nature itself. And the problems of things go on. Nature guards and protects generation and regeneration. It develops the father to nurse the, the sick and the weak. It give, develops the parental instincts which are necessary to provide later for human family relations. All these things are there and have been there since the dawn of time. Why does it then happen that now, after all this time, the all, only thing we can do with these powers of nature is destroy them because we do not wish to fall into harmony? with the laws of life themselves. The reason we don't want to live in harmony with life is because we don't understand life. We don't know what it is. If, like Lao Tzu, we sat on the side of a hill for a while, relaxed, and let the glory of creation shine into our hearts, we might do better. But instead of that, we are very busy running to one place for another, and uh, for the most part, wasting a, a number of hours every day watching television programs that leave something, at least, to be desired. Uh, they're not very good. But in any event, we are not taking advantage of the great nature mandala. We are not able to see God in nature. We see God as something sitting up in a throne, uh, aloof, like some high-bred politician. <laughs> we think of God as a despot, a benevolent despot, perhaps. But this God has people he likes and he doesn't like. He has beliefs he believes in himself and others he'll never believe in. We are never able to quite make out of this mysterious power the kind of parents we would all like to have. It, something has happened and cruelty has come in apparently. We don't realize that cruelty in this case was merely a correction that was very necessary. But if anything goes different to our wishes, it is cruel. If anything frustrates our ambitions, it is cruel. If anything shortens our lives from our own bad habits, that is cruelty. And we begin to recognize nature only as a frustration, as something that is eternally trying to prevent us from doing what we want to do. So to meet this emergency, science came into existence. Science took the attitude that there must be some way to get over the problem of nature always interfering with the will of man. <laughs> It was easy enough because science wasn't much troubled by theology anyway. So he didn't have to work that, that phase of the matter to any degree. So what science did, science did very definitely was to try to find means of evading or avoiding the consequences of conduct. Science wanted to build a wall around the individual so that he could live within a more limited area but exactly according to his own pleasures. He could get rid of the world by simply retiring from it. But he couldn't get any further than nature because there was no else place for him to retire to. So here we have now, after nearly 50 years of rapid scientific uh, progress and uh, a couple of wars and the panics and epidemics, all these things, we are faced with the fact that things don't seem to be right. There are problems we are not able to handle. So science is now quietly dropping back a little. Science is now emphasizing only certain phases of its beliefs. And the uh, average scientist is beginning to think in theological terms. And also in these worlds of political chicanery, more and more people in more and more nations are beginning to realize that the divine government is the only one that will ever last. That all the others are very temporary. And where the individual breaks the rules of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, he's in trouble. So that uh, suddenly we come face to face with the fact that the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount are rather important. 
Now, the Ten Commandments are very important because every one of them is based upon circumstances you can see in the mandala of the natural law. Every problem that comes up is handled in a way that reveals its cause and consequence. The only way you can avoid these recognitions is to ignore the patterns from which they are developed. And these laws or these patterns are absolutely necessary. I think I told you some time ago that the a group of scholars are deciding to rewrite the Sermon on the Mount. And among the things they didn't like was, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Well, that was kind of not exactly according to Hoyle. Uh, the meek was the last thing anybody wanted to be. So they have decided that, he, that Christ didn't say it which was the quickest way of getting rid of it, in their estimation. But whoever said it, or if it was actually composed by the printer of the book, it is still true. Uh, these truths are shown in nature. They are derived not from the mysterious depths of some cloistered laboratory. They are in the daily transactions of existence. They are in the relations of husband and wife, parent and child, church and state, everything. There are evidences that this material world in which we live is a magnificent diagram, a wonderful picture of the things that might be and should be. And it all began with the Garden of Eden, so to say. It began with an earth and a world in balance, everything in equilibrium, therefore without conflict, without difficulty, without dissipation, without pain. But the individual himself, as it says in Genesis, in a rather crude way, uh, decided to do it his way. And from that time came the troubles. The individual, breaking away from universal law, has not yet realized that something he can't win. We will continue to try to do it. We will call people intelligent who fight against truth. But you cannot do a thing that is contrary to this tremendous over-pattern on which the world is suspended. This in the Oriental method was the basis of the mandala diagram. The diagram was a picture of the invisible government of the world. It was also the picture of the invisible government of man by the invisible power inside of man. The human being from within himself has the answer to all things. The human being outside of himself has no answers that are legitimate. So, here we are coming into another century, coming into another time of testing. And what we need definitely to is to find again the foundations of nature. Well, where would we find these foundations? They are not to be found really in the present generation, although they are hinted at. We have to cover the whole pattern of human life. The mandala is a living, moving thing. It is not a picture painted on something and left to hang on a wall. The real mandala is a moving universe, every moment changing, every moment growing, every moment setting up new patterns and new privileges and new powers, but always in peace, always in wisdom, always in love, so that the creating power becomes, as so to say, the deity behind all change, because it is ordains all change. Change must come because there must be growth. Things must unfold, and it is the purpose of nature that all things shall sell in the, dunus, in the fullness of time, become divine a part of the pattern. Now, when we go to another phase of this whole situation, we go it again into the political and social phases. What is the great government? What is the invisible government of the world that we hear about in the midst of the cloistered Himalayan heights? What is this invisible government? It is the government of the internal over the external. It is the government of that which is locked within, and which is being deprived of the right of expression. Day by day and year by year, we must break down the, the wall between ourselves on the outside and ourselves on the inside. This is something far worse than the Berlin Wall. It is the wall that we have built around our conduct is com to completely separate it from our conscience. We have an internal life, sufferings, saddened, finally, practically destroyed, 
by the corruptions of the external and has no more strength to fight back. We are gradually allowing the outer world to destroy the inner life. Well, we say we're allowing it, but unfortunately, or fortunately, nature doesn't take this attitude. Nature will never allow the outside to win against the inside. The outside is a dependency. It is something that is built upon inner life. The life of the outside is on the inside. And no way can we make it stay on the outside and continue to grow. We are fighting constantly to maintain a system that can never survive. We are determined to sacrifice life, generations, our own children, our human conscience, and all that is important and sacred in life. We are willing to sacrifice all this in order to keep on doing the things that are wrong. Now, some of the things that are wrong seem to be very pleasant, but actually they are not. Nothing is, is pleasant that does not service the purposes and needs of mankind. Now, another thing that comes up in, the, in this kingdom of, of nature is the vegetables. Now, actually, our garden is the, is the garden of the gods, as the Muslim calls it. We are really living in the presence of the most beautiful garden that is imaginable. And not only is it a beautiful garden, but it is the basis of help. And just the same honesty and the keeping of the laws that we, write, we have to have to live socially and politically, we must apply these same laws to our own personal habits. The human body is part of a perfectly working mechanism which we gradually pervert, destroy, or damage. We do it largely from the same old motive, profit. We have become accustomed to extravagant living simply because it makes money for somebody, because it is a, a passion, a, a kind of likeness which makes us all happy because it tastes good. Out of this comes all kinds of illness because we have broken the laws of natural nutrition. And whether it's nutrition or the, uh, other things, food and, drunk, food and Drug Act, all these things, we are breaking the rules in order to do what we please and we're getting sicker every day. Therefore, little by little, we're beginning to understand that there are things we simply can't do without paying an awful price for doing them. Now, we're coming into a new generation here and very shortly. And this generation will be slowly retired to the point where it is a great mandala on the wall of heaven. This 20th century will be a picture to show advantages and disadvantages, show growth and failure, will show peace and war, and it will sum up to show what we have gained by a hundred years of civilization, so-called. We will also begin to understand what is the matter with our schools, what is the matter with our personal lives, why we are not doing better with our children, why we are overwhelmed with narcotics. All these things will be obviously there. Uh, those who come after us will look at it and uh, they'll say, well, it's too bad. They should have done better than that. In the meantime, if we're not careful, they will be doing something just as bad. We will do everything poorly as long as selfishness and gain and greed are the primary factors in life. And how are we going to get rid of them? Well, there have been some who have done it. Santa Teresa has done it. And uh, several of the great saints of the early church. St. Francis de Assis has done it. There were also in the other parts of the world sages, teachers, and wise people who have made that adjustment. The Greeks made it. Probably the greatest of them all was Pythagoras. He paid with his life. Plato, he made it. And we have given him some credit, but that we suffer from a bad translation of him by Dr. Jowett. We also have found other great people. We know the world teachers made it, but we do not want to make it their way. We do not want to make it by growing. We want to make it by keeping quiet and letting heaven bestow the benefits. 
Heaven doesn't work that way. We are beginning to realize it is a mistake to spoil children. Heaven found that out a million years ago. It is a mistake to spoil people of the 20th century. All these things are part of a great religious mystery. The great paintings of law are not on the walls of Karnak, but on the walls of heaven. Everything around us teaches us to honor God, teaches us to find God in all things, and to find this God as a principle of integrity in all relationships of life. We are given the privilege of growing, and as we grow, to overcome the mistakes which have made past experience more difficult or uncomfortable. We are perfectly privileged to grow whenever we want to, but there is no one that is going to thrust growth upon us. If we prefer to remain as we are and fight with our relatives for the rest of our lives, we have the privilege of doing so. But somewhere in the great out there, these things come to pattern. Nature points out clearly that the end of its processes of growth is not annihilation. Nature does not build things age after age, century after century, in order to destroy it. Growth is not intended to end in dissolution. Growth is said to end in completion, in perfection, in attainment. Therefore, there can be no concept of completion apart from the correction of the mistakes with which we are burdened. We have carried some of these mistakes to the beginning of history. Others we have changed. We have a school system that could put these mistakes and how we made them in perfect sequence. We could take a school system and work out a study in the relationship of action and reaction that would be astonishing. We could prove conclusively that every misfortune of man has arisen directly from an et a dishonest effort on the part of the human being to cheat nature or his fellow man. These things are part of rules that we cannot break and cannot destroy. They're all the part of the law. But above it all is this beautiful, beautiful thought. The, tr the fact that we find God in the peace of the, uh, of the garden. It is said that God walked first in the garden. And then while it was a garden, he came every day in the cool of the evening. It is also true that the God in us can walk in the garden. It is perfectly true that if we will get some of the weeds out of it, there will be room for us to walk in the garden instead of falling over the dead shrubbery and the burrs and, and difficulties. We need to know that there is the nearest communion with God will not be in a building made by men, but be in the great house made by deity itself. The universe is the great house. The universe is the place where we find deity in the innermost and the outermost and find reality as the simplest system of simply being kind. We find all these very common virtues. Why not teach these to children? Why not put out a textbook for school, for school children, emphasizing and proving conclusively, scientifically, that selfishness can never win, that dishonesty can never pay, that weakness can never end in growth, and compromise can never end in happiness. If we put all these factors together and work with them, we can make a very sizable proof, not only of the importance of nature to us and to the ages that come after us, but also the spiritual communion which we achieve through contact with deity in the actual workings of the universal plan. We must do some of these things, or else we will find ourselves uh, deprived of so many privileges that life will hardly be worth living. There are many complaints now about the unhappiness of things. This unhappiness will continue until we realize that out in the meadow, flowers of a thousand colors, with many petals and few petals, each one a perfect organism, something beautiful and wonderful, from the tiniest little blade coming through the earth to the old sequoia trees with their thousands of years of growth. Nature is a great temple, a great house of quietudes, 
where we can see nature growing in its own way, which is just God coming out from within these forms into manifestation as the rules and laws of good life. We can all do something to help ourselves, and we'll do much better if instead of looking for some way to think ourselves along with troubles, to think ourselves into the curing of them. And if we get to work and make a good job of that, uh, the future will be better. And we will realize that there can no longer be an atheist, because no one can explain the mystery of life by atheism. No one can decry the presence of a deity. No one can say that all these things were put together for no purpose, by no power, and that all things are one accident. All accidents lead to trouble. All intents solve troubles. And at the present moment, we are living too much by accident and in the years ahead to solve our problems. We must live by intent, by a voluntary contribution with the world and with life and with the plan for which we were created. There has to be a plan. It is visible everywhere except in the human mind, which has finally decided that it wishes to make its own plans at all costs. It has made a number of plans, most of them pretty bad. We've got to come back to think with God instead of merely thinking of Him. We have to think with the law instead of standing back, living our own lives and talking about the law. Live the principles we believe and heaven will return in all its glory and peace will come back to this troubled earth. Thank you.